Um, I find that there is an element in the later Wittgenstein remarks on ethics which is widely unnoticed and deserves some attention, namely a particular notion of the other. This notion is connected to what might be called the transcendental or absolute character of ethics, which is to be found in the whole of Wittgenstein thinking. But leaving out the special role which the other plays in his later remarks, um, some important changes in this idea of the absolute character of ethics is often left unnoticed. I'm aware that any talk about Wittgenstein's conception of ethics is problematic. In the literature surrounding Wittgenstein's scarce treatment of ethics and morality, at least three different claims are frequently brought forth. First, that Wittgenstein's remarks do not amount to any coherent, substantial, or meaningful uh, discussion of ethics at all. Secondly, that he's trying to make us give up the very idea that ethics in any way can be given a philosophical treatment. And thirdly, that everything Wittgenstein thought could not be said about ethics has not been said in precisely the right way in his early writings on, bit, on ethics, thus explaining why there are so few remarks on ethics in the later philosophy. There's simply nothing left to be said, as some commentators have put it. Against all of these objections, I want to argue for a number of claims. Firstly, that there is such a thing as a Wittgensteinian conception of ethics. Secondly, that this conception finds the most interesting form in his later writings. And finally, that it can contribute to a philosophical investigation of ethics, as, at least as far as it raises an important but often overlooked question in the present debate in moral philosophy. To make the case for these claims, I'd like to begin with the quote, the um, <coughs> just mentioned quote, which I found quite helpful, partly because it makes it possible to exemplify a feature which marks the continuity and thereby the special character of Wittgenstein's thinking <coughs> on ethics, and partly because it might as well serve as a reminder of what is being missed if one doesn't recognize the differences between the early and the later remarks. The quote is from a novel by an Irish writer called Toybin called The Heather Brazing. The main character is a young boy, Eamon, who is very dependent on his father's family, especially his grandmother. This particular scene, which I'll just quote, takes place just after the funeral of, funeral of one of the mother's, grandmother's other sons, I mean, not the father of the boy, but other sons, who's called Stephen. I quote. Shortly after the grandmother came down from the room where Stephen had died, her hair hung loosely down her shoulders, but when she saw him, she put it up again with both hands. She was wearing a black dress. Poor Eamon, she said. Poor Eamon. He clasped herself to her breast, but she moved away quickly and went in and sat alone in the living room till the others came and sat down beside her. No one must touch her. Touch me, she said. No one must ever come near me again. They sat silently, all of them, until one of the nuns came and asked where they kept the consecrated candles. I'll try just to take a short look at what's at stake here. A boy, Eamon, who, as we have previously learned in the novel, already motherless, is now rejected by his grandmother. This might at first seem to be the tragedy of the passage. But I find there's a number of interesting questions or problems which still remains. Firstly, there's the question of what the grandmother is actually doing. And secondly, whether the situation should be described in ethical terms. I'll try to answer these questions in two steps. The first step is devoted to unfolding, sorry, <coughs> to the unfolding of some fundamental aspects in Wittgenstein's conception of ethics in general. Whereas the second step sketches out how this conception is altered in the later thinking, as Wittgenstein reconstructs the idea that ethics presents itself as transcendental or absolute demand within the imminence that is our lives. Now we come to kind of the second part of, in the disposition on the handout. In order to bring out what I find <laughs> is a particular and quite unusual conception of ethics found in all of Wittgenstein thinking, I will in this part of the paper try to explicate the continuities running through all his ethical remarks. Even though any such claim, of course, opens up the intricate problem of how to read the tractatus, I will not give this work any independent treatment in this context. 
and my goal primarily is to draw up a background for Wittgenstein's later conception of ethics. Instead, I hope or think that my presentation will paint a quite familiar picture of Wittgenstein in ethics. The purpose of mentioning the Tractatus is all at all is to show how Wittgenstein holds on to elements from the early period throughout his thinking, expanding and supplementing them, but not giving them up. The interesting thing, the main point of the paper, is how this supplement, that is Wittgenstein's later view of the role of the other, changes the whole flavour of his ethical views. In sketching a Wittgensteinian view of ethics, two central ideas seem to be, have to be put in place, namely the idea of ethics as an attitude and the role of the meaning on of world or of life. In the Tractatus, ethics seems to be connected to this exactly the meaning of life. Wittgenstein talks, talks about in 6.4.1 the Sindamelt, the meaning of life, of the world, sorry. And in the same paragraph, he relates this to the concept of value. What seems to be evident in these sections, in this section, is that Wittgenstein wants to oppose the idea that value in some way constitu constitutes a fact. Ethics he seems to be saying, it's not something which can be revealed by scientific or other kinds of investigation. It takes a completely different shape. In the Tractatus, value is furthermore presented as something which is opposed to what is co coincidental, so that in some form seems to be necessary or absolute. Ethics is furthermore said to be transcendental and arising not from how the world is, but from the fact that it is. Um, Wittgenstein thus seems to be, presenting, to be presenting a view of ethics as a condition for the way we live, a condition which is somehow connected to the meaning of the world. Even though these ideas provide at best only a very formal description of ethics, more help is to be found in the Tractatus. It is namely also noted that ethics is connected to the concept of will, not the empirical will of any particular person, but instead a particular condition for being a human being, namely that we meet the world as will, as being which will have to live and act in the world given to us. But in any recognizable sense of the world, of the words to live or to act, it isn't possible to do this in the world of chance, mere chance, mere contingency. Having to act, having a life to live, necessitates another relationship to the world a relationship with what one might call an attitude toward the world as meaningful. This idea of a connection between ethics and a demand for meeting, for meaning in one's attitude towards the given, the world, or the life you have to live therein, reappears in later remarks. For example, this one from 1946, and this is the first one on the handout. <coughs> Wenn das Leben schwer erträglich wird, denkt man an eine Veränderung der Lage. Aber die wichtigste und wirksamste Veränderung, die des eigenen Verhaltens, kommt uns kaum in den Sinn, und ihr können wir uns schwer entschließen. It is often said that Wittgenstein thinks of ethics as characterized by being in attitudes and verhalten towards life, but it's rarer to find this idea spread out. <coughs> I think at least two aspects of the concept of an attitude has to be emphasized. First, to have an attitude towards something requires an effort to see clearly what you're having an attitude towards. If this requirement is not met, you'll be simply be having an attitude towards something else. Truly having an attitude towards something thus on the one hand involves some kind of acceptance of what you're relating to. But an attitude is not just acceptance. It's also seeing the given as standing in a particular relationship to your own life. Thus, having an attitude on the, one ha on the other hand means relating to the given as possibilities, necessities, demands, etc. Even though an attitude implies acceptance, it's nevertheless active and it concerns you. It bears for the, the demand to consider how to use and administer the given. This side of the idea of ethics as an attitude is in the early thinking expressed by connecting ethics to the meaning of life. In the later thinking, it is more often expressed as a demand for a continuous working on one's picture of one's place in the world. In this respect, I think, and this is a minor point, it's possible to point to a parallel between the method of Wittgenstein's later philosophy and ethics. <coughs> 
both are guided by the need to find an at least temporary transparency within a certain area of our being in the world. And both activities require that you continuously question deeply rooted and possibly flawed pictures of human existence. According to the later Wittgenstein, to live up to the demands inherent in philosophical activity, you must strive to see your own expectations, sorry, to see how your own expectations stand in the way of a clear view. Nicht an Schwierigkeit des Verstandes, as Wittgenstein puts it, sondern des Willes is to überwinden. Likewise, to act ethically is the attempt to try not to be blinded by your own wishes and needs, your prejudices, in deciding what is ethically relevant in a particular situation. This parallel between ethics and philosophy, I think, is the reason why it's almost impossible to tell <coughs> whether Wittgenstein is making a philosophical or ethical admiration in the following quote. Entschuldige nichts, verwische nichts, sie und sah, wie es wirklich ist. But Wittgenstein also identifies a difference between philosophical and ethical activity, <coughs> a difference which lies in their respective points. Philosophical investigation is driven for the wish for clarity itself, and its goal is solely the removal of misunderstood or flawed pictures of language or of existence. Ethical reflection, uh, to the contrary, uh, or the contrary, is essentially practical, as it strives to accomplish a clarity which makes the existence, in a certain sense, navigable. The two notions of ethics as an attitude and an, as an aspiration for practicability come together in one of Wittgenstein's remarks from 1937. The lösung des Problems, das du im Leben siehst, ist eine Art zu leben, die das Problemhafte zum Verschwinden bringt. Aber haben wir nicht das Gefühl, dass der, welche nicht ein Problem sieht, für etwas Wichtiges, Wichtiges ja, das Wichtigste, blind ist? Möchte ich nicht sagen, der lebe so dahin, eben blind, langsam wie ein Maulwurf, und wenn er bloß sehen könnte, so sähe er es das Problem? Oder soll ich nicht sagen, dass wer richtig lebt, das Problem nicht als Traurigkeit, also doch nicht problematisch empfindend, sondern vielmehr als eine Freude, also gleichsam als, als einen lichten Äther um sein Leben, nicht als einen fraglichen Hintergrund? In this quote, we find an idea of the problem of life that seems to echo the Trinitarian notion of the meaning of the world. But Wittgenstein first <coughs> claims that the notions of the meaning of the problem of life are in every respect practical. They cannot re be resolved by discovering something or reflecting on something. Rather, the only way to deal with them is by changing the, one, one, the way one lives. Wittgenstein thus points to view of ethics as practical in, practical in a radical sense, something which I will return to in a moment. However, moreover, he says that someone who doesn't consider his life to be a problem in some sense is shutting out the most important part of living, namely the continuous, continued consideration of how to live. And this remark resonates with an ancient point in moral philosophy. Namely that, as Socrates might have put it, the unexamined life is not worth living. Wittgenstein seems to be saying that to be a human being, to have a life to live, demands of you that you consider how to live this life. But, and this is very unusual, Wittgenstein in this context goes so far as to speak of the right way of living. Namely a life where one is able to live without being worried about this type of considerations. We should be able to see, he tells us, that the question of how to live is an integrated part of life. We find the same insistent, insistence that striving to be a better person is a necessary part of being human in others of Wittgenstein's remark, for example, the following from 1937. Okay. Niemand kann mit Wahrheit von sich selbst sagen, dass er Dreck ist. Denn wenn ich das sage, so kann es in einem Sinn wahr sein, aber ich kann nicht selbst von dieser Wahrheit durchdrungen sein. Sonst müsste ich wahnsinnig werden oder mich ändern. Wittgenstein seems to defend the relatively radical view that it's only possible to escape the demand to be a better person through some type, some type of form of repression. 
He simply presents the attempt to do better as part of what it is to see one's own shortcomings and failings. A very similar point is to be found in a lecture on ethics, where, where Wittgenstein writes, and I quote, Suppose I told one of you a preposterous lie, and he came up to me and said, You are behaving like a beast. And then I were to say, I know I behave badly, but then I don't want to behave any better. Could he then say, Ah, then that's all right? Certainly not, I expect the time. The thought that acknowledging <coughs> one's flaws necessarily implies an attempt to change is therefore not something novel to the later thinking. The Wittgenstein analysis that the necessity is to be found in a person's relationship with, in, with herself, it's not a demand coming from the outside. Later in the paper, I'll try to present Wittgenstein's further description of this demand and how it arises. But for now, bear with me. I'll take a short digression into the description of the particular practical character of ethics. <coughs> of all, of all, sorry, even though it's well hidden, the idea is to be found already in the Tractatus, and I think the Tractatus can help us to flesh out this idea. In the only longer passage of the Tractatus, which frames of a more traditional view of ethics, speaking Sanchez, and I'll take this quote in English. When an ethical law of the form thou shalt is laid down, one first thought is, and what if I do not do it? It is clear, however, that ethics has nothing to do with punishment or reward in the usual sense of the terms. So a question about the consequences of an action must be unimportant. At least those consequences should not be events. For there must be something right about the question we posed. There must indeed be some kind of ethical reward and ethical punishment but they must reside in the action itself. It is clear that since Wittgenstein here claims that ethics has nothing to do with remote reward and punishment in the usual sense of the words, he's not trying to advance a traditional law conception of ethics when said a principle is established and upheld by external authority. Instead, he seems to turn the idea of reward and punishment upside down by saying that these must reside in the action itself and that any ethical consequences, consequences of an action are not events, but something completely different. I think these two points should be understood together. If there are no external ethical authorities, then the ethical is radical dependent on what you actually do. In areas where there are rules with some kind of independent authority, the rule itself is not challenged but annihilated when someone breaks it, at least not first time. But if Wittgenstein thinks that ethics has no laws and no external authorities, then every single act both establishes an ethical rule and follows it at the same time. Ethics thus becomes the task of sustaining rules on no grounds whatsoever. It, represent, it presents an unstable and temporary order and chaos. The ethical action bears the reward and punishment in itself because the ethical consequences of it are not the changes, changes it may bring about in reality, but the way it may change our ethical view of the world. In other words, according to the early Wittgenstein, ethics is always in the process of being established in every single action, ethical action, we establish it anew. <coughs> yeah. This very same idea about the continuous establishing of ethics as a part of what ethics is reappears in the later thinking. Reappears in the later thinking. In a conversation with Rush Rees, Wittgenstein puts the point like this. Well, suppose I say I think Christian ethics is the right one. Then I'm making a judgment of value. It amounts to adopting Christian ethics. It's not like saying one of these physical theories must be the right one. The way in which reality corresponds or conflicts with a physical theory has no counterpart here. And Wittgenstein says that the making of a, that making a judgment of value or claiming that an ethical practice is the right one is at the very same is the very same thing as adopting it. He's saying that making ethical judgment is at the same time establishing the conditions for that judgment. Any establishing of an ethical practice is in some ways 
in some way itself a part of that praxis. Ethics is thus not the following rules, the formation of human beings or the like. Instead, it's the continuous establishing of meaningful reference points by which to live, those being rules, religious norms, or otherwise in character. Ethics is, as Wittgenstein puts it in another context, the leidenschaftliches sich entscheiden vor eine Versuch zu sehen. Of all the ideas to be found in, ethical, in Wittgenstein's ethical remarks, I think this idea is one of the most foreign to contemporary moral philosophy, as it on the one hand inflates the whole distinction between metaethics and normative moral theory, and on the other hand projects a deeply rooted philosophical assumption, yeah. namely that ethics is to be discovered by some sort of investigation of human nature, of human preferences, human utility, reasons, reality, etc. <coughs> Instead of having these ideas, Wittgenstein thinks that ethical questions are exclusively raised and exclusively settled by means of our actions, by what we actually do, by means of the way we live. Something which I think is the back is the background or form the background for Wittgenstein's continual denial of the possibility of theoretical investigations to settle ethical questions. The Wittgenstein holds on to the conception of ethics as essentially practical, shows that he also, in the later philosophy, thinks that ethics has, in some form, an essentially personal side. This shows, for example, in the following remark from 1946, and I quote, Wenn das Leben schwer erträglich wird, denkt man an eine Veränderung der Lage. Aber die wichtigste und wirksamste Veränderung, die des eigenen Verhaltens, kommt uns kaum in das Zehn und zu ihr können wir uns schwer entschließen. Hier, Wittgenstein seems to point to a central problem in ethics, namely that one can never force a change in other people or the world. This means that any ethical description discrepancy between one's expectations and an actual situation can only be solved by changing one's attitudes toward the situation of the people involved in the situation. For example, from acceptance to rejection, from being involved in something to drawing out. The working through the network with problem is in this sense completely dependent on oneself. As we shall see later, this, however, does not mean that the later Wittgenstein sees no intersubjective dimension in ethics. It just means that what he calls the solution of an ethical problem must be personal. This connects to another point which is found in all of Wittgenstein's thinking, namely that ethics concern everything that can be regarded as ethically relevant for any particular human being. Both in the Tractatus and the later remarks, Wittgenstein rejects the idea that ethics Ethics is a particular area of people's lives or of the world. What is relevant for ethics is only settled by what people actually refer to as ethically relevant, but what, by what they actually find important in their lives. And this can be very diverse from person to person. <coughs> Thus, ethics cannot be characterized by means of content. It's not a particular area of life, but instead arises from the fact that we have lives to live. Thus equipped, I think, I hope, that we are now able to give a more Wittgensteinian answer to the question of what the grandmother in the Toyden quote is actually doing. It's not the case that she, through the loss of her son, has discovered a new reason for acting which makes her reject relationships with other people. And it's not the case that she's projecting her own sorrow, or her own intention of not being hurt again, onto the world, just finding it right for her to avoid the future possibility of such a hurt. Instead, see, instead she is, or oh, this is how I think Wittgenstein would describe it, the early Wittgenstein especially, changing her attitude towards the world to an attitude of absolute rejection of any relationship with other people. She doesn't necessarily think that the world has changed in any significant way, but she's simply giving up a particular way of viewing the world, namely as offering meaningful relationship with other people. Secondly, I raise the question of whether her reaction should be described as ethically, ethically relevant. To this I would argue that Wittgenstein would say, yes, of course. And from what we have heard of his conception of ethics so far, he could say no, not very much more than this. The attitude toward the world as offering no meaningful relationships with other people is a possible and understandable attitude 
especially in the groundless circumstances. But this somehow doesn't seem to be an adequate ethical description of the situation. Something seems to be missing. For example, the grandmother's res responsibility towards her grandson. <coughs> and maybe even more than that. In the remaining part of the paper, I'll try to show how it's not until the later remarks that Wittgenstein develops his final answer to this question. It's not until these remarks that he settles the question of why the rejection of other people is especially ethically relevant and central. In his answer, and his answer, simultaneously show why ethics, even in the very loose sense described here, always presents one with an unlimited demand, thus leaving the ethical subject with unlimited responsibility. Or to put this differently, it's not until his later writings that Wittgenstein unfolded a coherent view of how ethics presents demands on our attitudes towards the other. Until now, in the paper, I have focused on points in Wittgenstein's later conception of ethics, which also marks points of continuity with, with his early thinking. But in this last point, <coughs> in this last part of the paper, I want to show how there are also important differences between the two. Yeah. A few points will just be mentioned in passing. Namely, that more traditional aspects of ethics reappear or appear, actually, in the later remarks. One example is a longer remark from 1949, where Wittgenstein considers the condition for calling anything an ethical teaching. And it's on the handout, um, but I won't read it due to lack of time. <coughs> in this quote, it's quite clear that Wittgenstein now thinks that some form of freedom, as some possibility of forming one own, one's own life, is a necessary condition for ethics. He furthermore supplements this notion of positive freedom with the fundamental notion of justice by rejecting that a proposed teaching could be ethical on the grounds that it's simply so fundamentally unjust that the concepts of right and wrong quite finds no place within it. This is a bit of the quote. Wittgenstein writes, a Hatsi, he's talking about a thought of God, a Hatsi in seiner Güte erwählt und er wird die strafen. Hat er keinen Sinn, als Wittgenstein zu sehen. Die beiden Hälften gehören zu verschiedenen Betrachtungsarten. Die zweite Hälfte ist ethisch und die erste ist es nicht. Und mit der ersten ist die zweite absurd. Furthermore, in the quote, um, the Wittgenstein introduces an idea of ethical upbringing. And in the later writings, and this is a general thing, Wittgenstein turns away from the idea that ethics is only the demand, the personal demand, to come to terms with the world. And he exchanged this for a much richer idea of ethics as someone which concerns one's relationship to the other. He talks a lot about how to justify ethics to other, how we talk about ethics. The other becomes a relevant partner in our ethical consideration, making ethics the activity of finding a meaningful conception of one life, a meaningful conception of one's life with the other. But I want to argue that the other plays an even more important role in the later remarks. In them, Wittgenstein seems to form a completely new conception of the absolute character of ethics. And he does this by focusing on the experience of the other as a fundamental source of ethics. This new and very important role which the other plays can, for example, be seen in one of Wittgenstein's more dramatic remarks. <coughs> I'm sorry for all the long quote. Ein Notschrei kann nicht größer sein als der eines Menschen. Oder auch keine Not kann größer sein als die, in der ein einzelner Mensch sein kann. Wem in dieser Not gegeben ist, sein Herz zu öffnen, statt es zusammenzuziehen, der nimmt, in, der nimmt der Heilmittel ins Herz auf. Man könnte auch, auch sagen, der Hass zwischen den Menschen kommt hervor davon her, dass wir von uns voneinander absondern, weil wir nicht wollen, dass der andere in uns hineinschaut, weil es darin nicht schön ausschaut. Man soll nun zwar vorfallen, sich seines Innern zu schämen, aber nicht sich seines vor den Mitmenschen zu schämen. <lacht> Wittgenstein, 
is saying, but he's not merely saying, that the distress and the suffering of a particular human being is always the greatest and the most terrible. He furthermore claims that this meets us with a demand to be able to open our hearts to the other and see, this, and see the suffering for the terrible thing it is. Thus, in the later thinking, the essential and most difficult part of ethics is presented as the demand to acknowledge our dependence on and our obligation towards the other. In the quote, Wittgenstein further recognizes how hard it is to stay open towards the other, both in your own suffering and in the face of someone else's suffering. When faced with the greatest suffering, you realize that you can never live up to the demands raised here, <coughs> the demand presented in the other's needs. But Wittgenstein maintains that but Wittgenstein maintains how ev each and every one of us must realize precisely this, that we will always have something to be ashamed of, something we cannot live up to. And in this realization, we must put ourselves open to view with all our imperfections towards the other. This may seem as an almost <coughs> impossible task, but Wittgenstein thinks it has helped to be found in what could be called the relationship with the other, namely God. In the middle of the previous quotation, Wittgenstein does this, and this will come afterward in the now. Wer das Herz so öffnet in ruhigen Bekenntnis zu Gott, öffnet es sich für die anderen. Er verliert dermal seine Würde als aufgezeichneter Mensch und wird daher wie ein Kind, nämlich ohne Amt, Würde und Abstand von den anderen. Sich vor den anderen öffnen kann man nur aus einer besonderen Art von Liebe die gleichsam anerkennt, dass wir alle böse Kinder sind. According to Wittgenstein, we often let the true and in some sense necessary shame over our own flaws and insufficiencies stand in the way of our relationship with the other. We don't want him to look inside because it doesn't look beautiful. But he thinks that only through the recognition and in particular the acknowledgement of own insufficiencies that we can meet the other because it is at the same time an acknowledgement of the fact that ethics present us with an absolute responsibility towards the other. Trying to hide the fact that in ethics you will or have failed is a form of vanity, namely the vanity of thinking that in this respect, in ethics, in the meeting with the other it's possible to succeed. God, or the idea of God, may help us to overcome this thought because any real openness towards God must be based on the realization that, by comparison, we are not perfect. The openness towards the other is thus only possible through a particular form of love, in the sense as the love that acknowledges that we are all wicked children. In the later remarks on ethics, Wittgenstein does present a fundamental demand to reject isolation. That is, for him, ethics raises a demand for love, for the recognition that human beings always have a need for and something to offer each other. In trying to spell out this demand, it arises several places. Wittgenstein often draws on a conception uh, of God very much in the fashion which he does in the quote about the infinite suffering. The connection between ethics and the idea of God is restated and elaborated upon in a remark from one of Wittgenstein's diaries. <coughs> And I quote, Sich selbst erkennen ist furchtbar, weil man zugleich die lebendige Forderung erkennt und dass man ihr nicht genügt. Es gibt aber nicht kein besseres Mittel, sich selbst kennenzulernen, als den Vollkommenen zu sehen. Daher muss der Vollkommenen einen Sturm der Empörung in den Menschen wecken, wenn sie sich nicht ganz und gar demütig wollen. Wie willst du nun den Vollkommenen nennen? Ist er Mensch? Ja, in einem Sinne ist er natürlich Mensch, aber im anderen Sinne ist er doch etwas ganz anderes. Wie willst du ihn nennen? Müsst du nicht, ihn nicht Gott nennen? Denn was entspricht die Idee, wenn nicht das? Aber früher habest du vielleicht Gott in der Schöpfung gesehen, das heißt in der Welt, und nun siehst du ihn in anderen Sinne in einem Menschen. Wir haben zwei verschiedene Vorstellungen von Gott oder wir haben zwei verschiedene Vorstellungen und Gebrauche für, das Be für beide das Wort Gott. Okay, trying to recapitulate. Capulate. In the attempt to achieve a true picture of oneself, 
Wittgenstein claims that one also sees what he calls the living demand, which must, by which he must mean a demand inherent in one's life. And he further claims that recognizing this demand is recognizing that one will never be able to live up to it. Throughout Wittgenstein's writings on ethics, oh, sorry, throughout Wittgenstein's writings, ethics remains something which cannot be fulfilled, and it is instead seen as the aspiration to get better, an aspiration inherent in our lives, which we can only accept through the acceptance of our own inadequacy. This is the reason why perfection, God, the other, if seen clearly, will always throw us into a state of uproar, namely the natural uproar, against being met with such unreasonable and preposterous demands. But even though the idea of the infinite nature of ethical demands is, I think, to be found in all of Wittgenstein's writing, there's a significant difference between the early and the later thinking at this point. Whereas the absolute character of ethics in the early thinking is expressed precisely in the expressibility of, the, uh, of ethics, in the collapse of our language, Wittgenstein now exclusively describes our experience of the absolute as an experience of the other or of God. The ethical demands appears when we are faced with the other as a representative of that which we strive for. One might see a parallel in the train changes of Wittgenstein's style of writing. Whereas the Tractatus tries to establish philosophical loitering solely by presenting us with a number of philosophical temptations, the style of the later work seems to represent an acknowledgement of the fact that insights is best achieved through dialogue, through cooperation, through the realization that the other may always have relevant contributions to offer. With respect to ethics, Wittgenstein therefore places the other as necessary, as necessary for an understanding of ourselves. And he, quite unusually, places both the other human being and God in this role. <coughs> in the quote, however, Wittgenstein also notes that we mustn't confuse two different concepts of God. One is the traditional Christian concept of God as the creator of the world, while the other is the concept of God as we can see him in the other, the God which shows us that we are all the children. This is the concept drawn on in the quote, and it can be found in another, in a number of Wittgenstein's more apparently more ethical remarks. And here comes a further one. God can hear sagen, ich richte dich aus deinem eigenen Munde. Du hast dir vor Ege von deinen eigenen Handlungen geschüttelt, wenn du sie an anderen gesehen hast. The reason why the experience of God and the experience of the other almost coincide in our aspirations to become better human being is that to Wittgenstein both represent the absolute demand for facing us in ethics and our absolute responsibility for meeting it. In this way, the two concepts are almost identical. The similarity is mirrored in the fact that the later Wittgenstein seems to connect the activity of creating meaningful full reference points for one's life, both to ethical and relig religious considerations. The question of the relationship between ethics and religion in, in his later thinking is complicated. But comparing his remarks on the two, it becomes evident that they both are connected with trying to figure out how to live. Yet Wittgenstein also points to a difference between the two, a difference which highlights an important aspect of his concept of ethics. In talking about religious belief, Wittgenstein presents it as the central part of religion that it's the possibility of belief which reaches far beyond any factual evidence. The difficulty with regard to religious belief is to achieve and hold on to one's faith in spite of whatever evidence one meets. But together with religious faith, the Believers also offered a suspension of all doubts and, a, a, and thereby a certainty which has no counterpart in, in ethics. And there's, a, and there's a quote which goes like this. Is it schwer, sich recht zu verstehen, den dasselbe, was man als Größe und Gute tun könnte, könnte man aus Fähigkeit und Gleichgültigkeit tun? Man kann sich freilich so und so aus wahrer Liebe benehmen, aber auch aus Hinterlist und aus Kälte des Herzens, so wie nicht alle Miete gut zu ist. Und nur wenn ich in Religion untergehen könnte, könnte dieses Zweifel schweigen, denn nur Religion könnte die Eitelkeit zerstören und in alles Spalten dringen. <lacht> 
Because religious belief is to surrender completely to the other God, it can at least give us the hope of certainty. But this certainty is not a possibility in ethics, because ethics <coughs> is a personal aspiration to meet the demands of life, and an aspiration for which we ourselves must take full responsibility. Um, as presented above, Wittgenstein thinks that we find both the ethical demand and its unrealizable character in the experience of the other. I'll make some final comments about this idea on the basis of how it appears in a reply if Hussein wrote to Drury in the latter complaint about being dissatisfied with his own performance working in hospital. And Vicky Sand writes, I mainly, I mainly think this. Don't think about yourself, but think about others, for example, your patients. Look at your patients more closely as human beings in trouble and enjoy the opportunity you have to say goodnight to so many people. <coughs> this alone is God, a gift from heaven, which many people would envy you. And this is the sort of thing that ought to heal your freight soul, I believe. It won't rest it, but when you're healthily tired, you can just take a rest. I think in some sense you don't look at people's faces closely enough. What I think is important here is that Wittgenstein is trying to make Drury aware of how the faces of other people, presenting which a task which is not just an ordeal but a blessing. Wittgenstein is not saying that Drury should stay put because other people's needs exceed his own, because they're greater than his. He's rather trying to remind Drury that we all have a need for other people and that we can only fulfill this need exactly by staying open towards them. Ethics is not a matter of give and take. Serving others does not give one the right to expect something in return. But as an ethical subject, all that one can do is to serve the other. This is simply the form the demand takes. If we allow it to, this responsibility may show itself in the simplest of things, because none rights, such as the opportunity to say goodnight to other people. Moreover, as we saw earlier, as the greatest suffering is always the suffering of the single human being. There are no limits to our ethical responsibility. But, um, but in this respect, sorry, the demand is not something one can fulfill. But shouldn't this, one might ask, shouldn't this actually throw us into a state of uproar? Isn't Wittgenstein here presenting a view of ethics which is simply unbearable in its absolute character? I think in one sense the answer is yes in another no. To see ethics for what it is, Wittgenstein thinks, is to accept that what cannot meet its demands. But he raises in the reply to jury, he raises a further issue. Wittgenstein comments that this is, and I quote again, this is the sort of thing of thing ought to heal your freight soul, I believe. It won't rest it, but when you're healthily tired, you can just take a rest. Here I think Wittgenstein points to the possibility of living in the face of ethics, in the face of the other, which is given despite the absolute character of the demand. It's given because the acknowledgement of one's imperfection is at the same time an acknowledgement that one is only, and an acceptance of the fact that one is only able to give this much. So then, when one is healthily tired, one has the right to take a rest. And now I'll just finish moment. I'll just let her go back to the ground world without the initial quote. <coughs> Seen in the light of Wittgenstein's view of the other, other's essential role in ethics in our life, I think a, fur a further dimension appears in this quote. The greatest tragedy of the situation is not the little boy losing a grandmother, someone on whom he depends, even though this loss is tragic enough. The real tragedy is the tragedy of the grandmother, which is at the same time a sin, you might say. The sin of rejecting to take any responsibility for the other. A sin is understandable as it would be for anyone, uh, as it would be in any case where a person reject, reacts in this way after a great personal loss. But in Wittgensteinian terms, it's still a sin. And according to, to Wittgenstein, nothing less than, than a primary one. The question is how this can be. How can ethics present us with such demands of resp responsibility towards the other? According to the later Wittgenstein, I think, the grandmother's sin is her loss at well. Oh, sorry. The grandmother's sin is her loss at well as well. 
because in giving up the attempt to stay open to other people, especially those dependent on her, she's giving up what is fundamental for her too, the relationship with other people. <laughs> the grandmother's reaction is a rejection of the demand to acknowledge, not the world as we might see it in the early in Wittgenstein's early thinking on ethics, but the existence of other people as that which cannot be rejected. And the later Wittgenstein would claim, this is the primary ethical sin because it's the sin of not accepting the unconditional demand rising from the ethical character of one's existence. Thank you.